Hi, this is Eric Martin with Board Game Geek. I'm here today looking at Francois Gendon's Quadropolis, a big box game from Days of Wonder that is debuting at the Con Festival in February 2016, due out in Europe in March, in the US in April 2016. It's a big game for two to four players, plays in about 45 to 60 minutes about building city. Okay, you're building your own Quadropolis here. Lots of city building games. How does this one work? Here are some of the components in Quadropolis. You have a shared construction board that is used by all players. Each player has a player aid with scoring, which I'll explain later. We have a building site here where we're going to put the tiles of our city. Each of us has one of these and we'll build on it individually. We have a whole bunch of people and fuel, which are used as we're building our city. A couple of pawns, which I'll explain later. And we all have four architects, numbered one to four. Aside from this, we have this box which of course has a million tiles in it which are used in the rounds of the game you see one two three four five at the bottom here uh this does not come crush but someone sat on my box oh, oy vey. okay the game lasts four rounds under the normal game the expert game goes up to five rounds and the box is divided with tiles so the expert tiles are up here so you can keep those set aside until you actually have played a number of times and are diving into the expert game and then these would hold the classic tiles if you want to separate those there's a uh, parks mini expansion up here and some t other architect tiles for the expert game all right how do we actually set up each round well you're going to pull out the tiles and you can put them in the bag if you're playing according to the rules. You would put them all in here, shuffle them all up, draw them out one at a time to fill the board, which is somewhat laborious. The two-player game is super fast. And if you do this for the two-player game, you take almost as much time laying out the tiles as you actually do to play the round. So what I've been doing is I just take out the stack, put it all face down, smoosh it around a bit, and then lay everything out. And I suppose if you were competing at a tournament level, you know, if you were that much of an expert Quadropolis player, you would know what these classic tiles are and be able to identify them and somehow use that information to your advantage, but I think it's pretty slight. I don't think we need that here. After you've laid out all the tiles, you turn over the tiles based on the number of players. With four players, you turn over everything. With three players, you leave the tiles with a four face down. With two players, you leave the fours and the three fours face down. Okay, on the assumption that we have a four player game, we'll turn everything face up. And now we're each going to take turns. The basic game again lasts four rounds and in each round you are going to take four actions and ideally take four tiles. And you do that by using your architects. So again, each player has architects numbered one to four. If you are the start player, you will have the mayor token to indicate that. And you will take one of your four architects and you will place it, let's say this one, on one row or column around the board. When you do that, you then count that many spaces, so two spaces, because I've got my two architects, one, two, and this is the tile I'm gonna take and then I must place it in my city in row two or column two. So all those numbers tie together with all your choices that you're making. So my two architect takes this, I place the urbanite or urbanist token on the board here. I place this in the second row or second column, depending on what plan I might have. First game, you might not have a plan, I'll just let you know. And then if there's something in the upper left-hand corner, as in this case, I get that resource. I get one bit of energy. This symbol up here tells me what type of tile it is in case I'm colorblind. And this figure in the lower right tells me what I need to activate this tile at the end of the game in order to score. So. There's no scoring during Quadropolis. We do everything at the end of the game we score. There are some tiles that have a number on them, such as this two and a star, that's worth two points. If you activate it at the end of the game, it will score. Okay. So, place my architect, place the urbanist, place the tile, get my resources, next player goes. Next player again has one to four, now you have some restrictions on what you can do. Once the urbanist is on the board, you cannot place something that would point at that figure. So I cannot place an architect here, 
here or here. Likewise, I can't cover up something that's already been placed. So you'll start getting these restrictions as the game goes on. Place this here, take the number four tile, move this, and now place this in the fourth row or fourth column. One additional aspect to building, and this is what has tricked people up in my games that I've played, is the apartment buildings, which are the yellow ones. In addition to being placed in a row or column, they can also be placed on a particular floor. So if I take this with a number four architect, I can place it in the fourth row, the fourth column, or on the fourth floor of an existing apartment building. Okay, so if I already had a permanent building that was three floors, I could place this on the fourth floor, no matter what row or column it was in on my board. If I take something with the one, well, hey, then I can place it as a first level anywhere on the board. Okay, the rules don't specifically say with the one you can place it anywhere, but they say with the number, it can represent that floor. Okay, so first floor anywhere. And then if I take uh, this one with the number two later in the game, I can place it as a second floor on here and so on and build up. And this is one of the ways to score. There are six types of tiles and each type of tile has a different scoring method. That only gets in the, don't worry about that right now. This is just about how to take tiles. So we're each going to be placing our architects around the board and eventually we're going to be piling up here. At some point, maybe you're forced to point at a blank space. Well, then you get nothing, but you still move this urbanist here. Or maybe you place something and you get this, but you don't want it. Okay, well, you can throw it away. Still place this here. You don't get the resource because you threw the tile away, but at least you don't have to put it on the board. Why would you not want to do that? Well, maybe you want to save a spot on the board for something else. And if I place this three, it's got to go in my third row or third column, maybe there's only one space. Uh, this could be a third floor, but maybe none of that applies. And I want to leave room for something else. Each of us are going to take four tiles. And at the end of the round, with four players, there'll be nine tiles left. And you throw all those away. Whoever took the apartment building that has the green mayor on it will become the new mayor for the next round. If no one did, the current player stays mayor. Everyone takes their architects back. And then you get out the tiles for the second round. And you spread them out again, and you do the whole thing over again. And you do this four times. In the expert game, five times. It's a little bit different in the expert game because instead of numbered architects specific to a color, you flip these face down. And you're going to use as many architects of the numbers one to five as the number of players. So in a two-player game, you have two ones, two twos, two threes, up to two fives. Each person is still going to take only four tiles, but now you're building on this advanced board that has 20 spaces, and everything gets a bit more complex. It's not just rows and columns anymore. If you get a five, it can go in this, or it can go in the four particular spots that are numbered five much more complicated in terms of how you're going to lay things out here. That's how you take the tiles. What about scoring? Here's an example of a completed city at the end of Quadropolis. You will take at most 16 tiles during the game, and ideally you're going to fit them all together in some way that will score you more points than everyone else gets. You will have all sorts of resources on the side that you collect during the game, and you can choose to place them on tiles as the game progresses just to help you keep track of whether you have enough whether you have too many. If you don't have enough people, then you can't activate all of the factories and harbors and public office buildings. They need people. You need people to put in your shops. You need fuel so that those shops and apartment buildings can stay heated and work. Okay. If you don't have the ability to activate a tile, you just throw it out. So you get no points for that. And that's not good. All right. At the end of the game, you arrange things how you want, and then you actually score. Now, each type of these six buildings scores a different way. The yellow are apartment towers or apartment blocks, and they score based on their height. And triangular scoring, one, three, six, or ten points for a building that is one, two, three, or four stories tall. So I got a three-story building with one here at seven points. Parks score based on their adjacency to apartment buildings, because you want nice places for the people in your city to walk around in. So this one's next to one building, that's worth two points. This one's next to two, it's worth four points. If you surrounded one on all four sides, that's worth 11 points. The shops need people, 
right? Because that will bring in tax dollars as they spend their money. You can put one to four people into a shop and that's worth one to seven points. So this is seven over here. This is only two, nine points for shops. The public services, you want to spread out throughout, uh, throughout your city. So that way everyone in your city has access to these utilities that they need. Okay. I'm in two regions here. That's going to be worth five points. If this one were down here, I would have services only in one region. That's worth two. If you get at least one in all four regions, that's 14 points, which is a lot. The harbors, as you might guess from actual harbors, you want them in a long line in a row or in a column or both. And you score based on the longest continuous line of harbor tiles. So three tiles in a row is worth seven points. If I had managed to place this one here, that'd be worth 12. But if I have one tile vertically, that's worth zero. Okay, in this case, this is actually seven plus three is 10 points. Factory score based on their adjacency to harbors and shops because they will be supplying, all right, the shops and harbors and moving one thing to another. All right, that's how you work, make the town work. They get two points for each adjacent shop and three for each adjacent harbor. So this would be worth seven points. That would be worth eight. And you get a total of 15 for factories. Now you may notice I got some fuel here, uh, just shoved in the park. You can dump excess fuel, don't tell anyone, in the parks and it absorbs it. Makes it nice for, you know, a squishy place that people go for a walk. You can do that with one fuel each, and you want to do that because each excess fuel and person that you have costs you a point from your score, which isn't good. So you want to ideally have exactly as much as you need, but better to have too much than too little because if I threw, if I was one person short, well, then I'm going to make fewer points from the shop. All right, one fuel, I may have to lose this, which costs points for the park and for the tower itself. All right, the advanced game adds different types of tiles. We have office towers and monuments. Office towers score similar to apartment buildings in that they can go higher and they're worth more points the taller they are. But you also score for having them spread out throughout your city. So this is a group of two. And so that will score at a higher level than if I just had one on its own. Even if this one is just short, doesn't matter. And if I put a third one here, then we've got three connected and that again escalates the points. The monuments score based on their adjacency to parks and um, public utilities and shops, right? Because you make more money. People go to visit and then they walk around the park and they spend stuff at the store and so on. Uh, you lose points if you put them next to the factories and harbors because no one ever wants to go to a harbor to see a monument. Statue of Liberty. <coughs> um, and that is how we score. I would add all this up on my score pad and uh, add everything, lose one point for this, 51 points. Woo! Hopefully that's enough to win when I'm actually playing with other people. And there's an overview of Quadrupolis, which I've played five times now, once on a prototype and four on a review copy from Days of Wonder with two, three, and four players. Let's try all the player counts, but all with the classic rules, none of the expert tiles because you have to absorb the six types of ways to score, and I've had a new player in each game. So let's not hit everything at once. Days of Wonder historically has always tried to hit this ground where they want to deliver games that are for casual players and more experienced players. They want to hit the, that sweet spot that gets both of them, right? Ticket to Ride, which is what they're going to be known for forever. They're not going to get away from that, but that just, it works perfectly because if you're a casual player, you can still play the game well, you pick up cards, you claim track, you complete a few tickets, yay, right? I got this thing that's on the board and it's kind of neat and I did this. And you could have played better probably and maybe you should have taken more tickets or cut this guy off or anticipated something was going on or flush your hand earlier or, you know there's all these types of things in which you could have played better but you have something to look at and you like what you did and you can see it and then as you play more and you get better if you're a more experienced player you start anticipating these things more and you've got goals and you're reading what other people are doing and you know what tickets are in the game and you can anticipate maybe they're going here and you plan against them and try to work all that out it works on these two levels. Quadropolis, when I first played it in prototype form, is you know very rough, not finished artwork, just line drawings and you know little scribbles things, and 
it seemed much more abstract than the normal Ticket to Ride game. Okay, um, just you know, it's like all it was numbers and you're placing and trying to calculate all this thing out. But I think part of that was because that's kind of what I am as a gamer is you know trying to place and calculate and plan across the whole game and and do all that type of stuff. Right, but now I've played it with different people who are a little more casual and not quite as experienced, and you see it works on both of those levels, just like other Days of Wonder games. So you may not play well, but at the end of the game, you're going to have your city, and you can look at it and you'll say, "Oh, I shouldn't have put that harbor there. Should have connected this. I didn't need that shop. I didn't even use it. You know, so blah blah blah." And you sort of reconstruct everything, and you figure out, "Oh, this is maybe what I do next time." If you're playing a little more conscientiously, maybe you're going in, especially when you've played multiple times like I have now, you may this time, I'm gonna be sure to, I'm, I'm going for factories. I'm gonna do factories, uh, maximizing it with a harbor around it, and then shops planted in here, and max out everything. Or I want parks and apartment buildings, right? You know, wh whatever you're gonna do, you're gonna have a plan, and you're gonna play off what other people do because you're fighting for those resources on the board. The board gets laid out each round. You see what's available in which spots. You can plan a little bit how to use your architects to get certain things. I must use a three to use this, to get this particular type of tile, right? Based on what someone else has already done. So I want to do this now, or will it still be in there in the future, right? You're calculating all this stuff and trying to play off rather than just what do I do this turn, right? You can play at that level, but you can also have a plan for the round and then possibly a plan for the whole game. And you can adjust it based on what other people are doing. So it works at the, those two levels. They mesh together, which was surprising because it didn't seem that way initially, but in the end, it seems to. It's got the expert level again, which I haven't gone up to yet. We'll see what that adds. I've tried the parks mini expansion. All you do is you replace a few parks tiles with different parks tiles that now don't allow you to bury toxic waste because they're playgrounds do that uh, and they come with a child on there you know a person that you can put to work uh, somewhere <laughs> okay you know it's a little mini expansion or Adrian Martineau said he had extra space so they had came up with this little mini expansion and it's in the box for you to try out as well all right a little experts but it, it works on these these cross grounds okay will it work for everyone I don't know what do I know right I played five times and this is sort of the experience that I have Maybe you'll play it too.